why are those residential real estate prices going up? And, they, and the same thing's happening in the United States. The answer is that there is an exodus, and I don't think that's too strong a word, out of the cities. People are put off by, I mean, cities mm -hmm. have always been a trade-off. Cities are, okay, you have a lot of noise and some dirt and some hassles and maybe a slightly higher crime rate. But on the other hand, you have art and culture and museums and shows and restaurants and, and, and bars. And so you, you make the trade-off. You say, I'll accept these annoyances in exchange for all this, you know, culture and buzz and cities attract, you know, the brightest people. So whether it's, uh, you know, bankers or lawyers or doctors or artists, playwrights, actors, whatever, uh, it's just, there's a lot of buzz. That's why people go to cities. With these lockdowns, we've amplified all the negatives and taken away all the positives. We've shut the museums, the restaurants, the bars, the plays, the office buildings, things that attracted people. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, again, probably not as bad in Australia as it is here, but crime is on the rise. Murder rate in New York has doubled. Uh, suicide rates across the country have tripled. And that's that's New York, the suicide rates national. Um, there are all these dysfunctions and a lot of them, and of course, when you have highly concentrated populations, which you do in cities, um, a lot of that's where. So what people are doing, I say people, it's the people who can afford it. They're getting out of the cities and they're going to nearby suburbs or even further out what we call exurbs, which are, you know, the, the next ring beyond the suburbs. And so there is that demand for housing. I'll, I'll, I'd be willing to bet money that the place you're describing is a pretty attractive neighborhood. So they're, they're booming. And the same thing's true in the United States. But what's the other side of that? We're depopulating our cities. Cities are the greatest wealth generating phenomena in the history of civilization. I mean, that's what civilization means. It means cities. And so if we're depopulating and draining our wealth creating engine, what does that do to the economy long run? So for as an individual choice, it makes sense and I understand it. But the macro effect is we're depopulating these wealth generating uh, places. I mean, just take any downtown area. It could be Melbourne or Adelaide or Sydney or, or New York for that matter. If, if there's a, an attractive downtown office building, let's say you're a large company, insurance company, whatever, and you used to have 10 floors as your corporate headquarters. Well, now everyone's been working from home for almost a year. That's that's nothing that anyone would have recommended, uh, you know, a year ago. But we were forced to do it, and guess what? It works. Uh, employers it works. and employees are finding that hey, it works. You can communicate and get stuff done, and maybe it's, there's some attractions to it. So this work from home thing is here to stay. Uh, what yeah. companies will do? They'll say, well, instead of ten floors, I only need two floors, and I'll have attractive offices. But they'll you'll reserve them. You'll call up say, hey, I need an office two days next week to meet some clients done they'll build locker rooms they won't be like high school locker rooms they'll be very attractive <laughs> you'll keep your laptop and your sweater and your scarf or whatever in your locker you'll show up take your stuff out of your locker some receptionists will tell you which office is yours for those two days set yourself up meet your clients go home and work from home what does that mean if you cut uh commercial real estate capacity or utilization by 80 percent uh, we'll start with the cleaning crew and the reception but what about the food trucks the restaurants the shopping the public transportation uh drinks after work um you know on and on and on all the things that are ancillary to that downtown office location you cut that by 50 to 80 percent what is that doing to your economy so these are examples and by the way this will take a year to play out this is not an overnight thing uh so uh the tenants are not paying rent if they are they've called up and negotiated a 50 percent increase there's I'm, I'm, i have some involvement in commercial real estate and i, I see this in real time so rents are down by perhaps half or all the way to zero if they're not paying. And everyone says, well, you know, landlords are rich. No, they're not. The landlords take the rents, but they have mortgages. So if the tenants aren't paying the landlords, the landlords can't pay the mortgagee. Uh, and that falls on the banks, right? Uh, except the banks are clever. They've securitized it and sold it probably to, to you and me, right? Looking your, look, we have our 401ks, like a superannuation fund, but you look in the fund and do you have some... Uh, you know, a commercial real estate uh, REIT or something that Morgan Stanley sold you? Well, maybe you do. And what's inside? No one knows, but take a look. Um, so, but that ripple effect I just described can take a year to play out. So we haven't seen the end of this. So the bottom line on all this is that interest rates are going up in anticipation of inflation based on handouts. The reality is the handouts are not being spent, they're being saved, which does nothing for inflation. And it's also not sustainable, which is what are you going to do? Hand out 
a, a two trillion dollar deficit spending package every six months because that's kind of what we've been doing since last summer. And they keep saying, "Well, this is the last one; it'll be sustainable." It's not sustainable. It's a handout, and people need the money. But if they put it in the bank, which they're doing, this is a classic liquidity trap. So what's going to happen? Yeah. But meanwhile, meanwhile, the interest rates are going up, perhaps for the wrong reason, but they're going up. That's going to slow the economy further. We're already seeing mortgage applications dry up. Uh, we're seeing the housing bubble, not bubble, but pretty steep increase in, the, in residential housing starting to level up. So by, um, you know, hard to say, but I would say by March or April, this whole thing is going to go in reverse. Everything we just talked about is going to go in reverse. The economy is not going to have the traction. Unemployment is going to remain high. Velocity is going to continue to drop. There's not going to be any inflation. Those interest rates are headwind. They're going to drop and the price of gold is going to shoot up. So my advice to uh, the potential gold investors is uh, it's on sale. Uh, go get some right now. Uh, it's always better to buy low and sell high. And uh, <laughs> but I would expect the price to be much higher by mid-year. I know that you've said this before, or I'm pretty sure you've said this before, that to stimulate an economy, you need to reduce interest rates by somewhere around three, four percent to have an effect. When interest rates are currently at zero, how can you do that? Where do you go from zero? Well, a couple of things. Uh, the, the short answer is you can't. You, 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 in theory, you can go to negative rates, but negative rates don't work. We have experience from um, uh, the ECB, uh, Sweden, Japan, Switzerland, and elsewhere that negative rates don't work. They're, they're negative rates, but they don't. It's not more of the same. Cutting rates from 3% to you know, zero has a beneficial effect, but cutting them from zero to negative one now you're through the looking glass. You don't get any more pop. You don't get any more bang for the buck. And there are reasons for that, which are what, as a central bank, what signal are you sending? Well, see, the idea of negative rates is you're going to spend the money because if I'm going to take it away, you put money in the bank, even at zero, you put money in the bank, you go away for a year, come back, the same amount of money should be there. That's the zero interest rate. But a negative interest rate, negative 1%, you put $100,000 in the bank, you go away for a year, you come back, you only have $99,000. Because I took $1,000, that's 1% negative interest. So the idea is if I'm going to take your money, you're going to spend it fast because you don't want me to take your money. Uh, and that's going to have the stimulative effect that we talked about. That's not actually what happens. What happens, two things. Number one, uh, people have lifetime goals. Um, their retirement, their health care, their parents' health care, their children's education, buying a house. There's some large lifetime goal you have, and that's why you save money in the first place. If I'm taking your money away, you're going to save more, not less. You you still you still want to achieve that goal. I've made it more difficult, but you're actually going to save more. They want you to spend it, but now you're saving more. And the second thing is, what signal is a central bank sending when they have negative interest rates? Mm. They're saying that they're worried about deflation, not inflation, mm. but deflation. Yeah. So if they're telling me, if Central Bank is telling me that deflation is a problem, I'm going to wait. And why should I buy anything right now? Wait till the price drops. Um, and by the way, a negative interest rate, negative 1%, my example, is a nominal uh, phenomena. But in real terms, if you have deflation, my money is worth more. So even though my dollar amount may be less, my purchasing power went up because prices went down. And so negative, that's why negative interest rates don't work because A, you're sending a deflation mm -hmm. signal. So people defer spending and B, they have lifetime goals. So they actually save more. So negative rates don't work. So you see, so you're right. You're stuck at zero. There you are. I mean, you can do QE, you can do quantitative easing. Um, and usually what happens is they hand the ball over. I don't know if it's a rugby match or whatever, but they, they hand the ball from monetary policy, which is now impotent to fiscal policy, which is deficit spending. Uh, but there you have you have other kinds of headwinds having to do with very high, um, very high debt levels. More to the point, uh, in terms of you know what a what a central bank can actually do, they they can stimulate. They they can print money, uh, and governments can spend money and incur deficit spending. But again, none of it does any good if uh, if people don't actually spend it. And that's a psychological phenomenon. And the Fed or the Reserve Bank of Australia uh, or any central bank can print money, uh, no doubt about it, but they can't change people's psychology. You need, we had an external shock, an exogenous shock in the form of the pandemic that caused people to stop spending, save more, or they were unemployed, or you know, if you're the unemployed individual, you're, you're not taking your friends out for dinner these days, uh, you're putting money in the bank, and even if you still have your job, um, you're gonna save money 
because you're worried you might be next. You might be the next one to get laid off or your company might shut down next week or next month. And so you're going to save more. It's what economists call precautionary savings or, you know, in plain English, saving for a rainy day. Um, and that's what's going on. It's going on, going on uh, all over the world. And last time I was in Hong Kong, I was giving a speech very high level. The Asia Society was hosting it. And uh, somebody took me aside and said, uh, Jim, be careful what you say. The sequence is currency wars, trade wars, shooting wars. Shooting wars solved the problem. Uh, you know, mass mobilization warfare, destruction of capital, 50 million dead, very good for the labor market, very good for construction, very good for recovery. Not a, not a great way to get there. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Let's talk a little bit about the trade war. A lot of people say, well, this started in January 2018 because Trump put tariffs on solar panels and appliances, you know, your refrigerators or whatever. Well, yeah, you could say that, but I would say the trade war started in 1994 when China did a maxi devaluation of the yuan, continued through 2001, when they made a bunch of promises to join the WTO, World Trade Organization, and broke every single promise, continued through the early 2000s when they were manipulating the currency, and continued through 2016, where they were admitted to the uh, IMF special drawing right basket of currencies, one of only five, uh, and lied to the IMF because they said we'd have an open capital account, and they shut the capital account the following year. So what he did in 2018, I, I view as, re, as the U.S. finally got the wake-up call and retaliated. Here's the globalist mantra, and this goes back to the 1990s, and whether it's Richard Haas, Jeffrey Sachs, President Clinton, President Bush, you know, many others, it's a long list of people. They said, look, we understand that Chinese are communists and they're kind of bad actors and they do bad things, but if they're willing to embrace something that looks a little bit like capitalism, they will grow richer. Uh, they will grow more sophisticated. The education level will go up. We will accommodate that by letting them join the World Trade Organization and the IMF, even though we know they lie cheap still, because they will eventually get rich enough that they will be just like us. They'll throw off their communist masters, embrace a Western model, and it'll be just like Europe. We're, we're all on the same team, democratic, you know, quasi-socialist, but democratic capitalists liberal, in quotation marks, societies, and China will be just like us. That was the theory. I said it was wrong at the time, and time has proved that correct, meaning they're just rich communists. I said the only thing worse than a poor communist is a rich communist. And so we have created rich communists at the expense of our own workers, at the expense of our own economies. They are not like us. They're more communist than ever. Communists, atheists, uh, the human rights violations are you know, incalculable. They, if you're a Uyghur, uh, maybe a Muslim Uyghur, or a Catholic in China and you express any dissent at all, you will be arrested, you will be put in a concentration camp, doctrinated with communist philosophy. Maybe you'll get it, maybe you'll fake it, maybe you won't. But for those who apparently don't get it, they're strapped to an operating table without anesthetic and their organs are removed while they're still alive and sold to the organ uh, tourism industry, this huge multi-billion dollar transplant industry in China, and then they cremate the bodies. That's real, and what does that sound like? You know killing innocent people and cremating the bodies. And um, we've we seen that movie before. So that's who, I don't know why we do business with China at all. So that's who you're dealing with. They're not getting more like us. They've elevated Xi to, uh, first of all, president for life. There used to be this, you got two, two five-year terms. And then in your second term, you appointed, uh, you kind of announced or anointed your successor, who would then pick up the reins at the end of your second five-year term. That process, was, uh, which is driven by consensus, was working very well and giving China a little bit of stability. Xi tore it up. He's in his second five-year term now, but he did not announce a successor. And they, at the last National Party Congress, they changed the rules so that um, he can stay on indefinitely. So he's president for life. Uh, they also created something called Xi Thought, which is a big deal because it elevates his uh, ideological musings to the level of Mao Thought. He's only the second uh, Chinese leader to get that designation. All the others, you know, okay, you're president of China, head of the Communist Party, whatever, but they were never treated on a par with Mao. Xi is. So we have Xi thought. Uh, we have, you know, gross human rights violations, geopolitical confrontation, near war in the South China Sea, um, you know, testing the boundaries <laughs> with India. All the you know intellectual property theft, lie, cheat, steal through the economy. Their numbers are fake, by the way. I'm sure you've heard of 
something called Goodhart's Law. Goodhart's Law says, when a metric becomes the object of policy, it loses meaning as a metric. So in other words, if you compute your GDP honestly, it's valuable information. It tells you what your economy is doing. But the minute you target GDP as a matter of policy, it loses meaning because you're just manipulating to a result. That's what they're doing. And this is a big deal because U.S. companies are watching this now. Apple's the, is the although the Chinese value added in the iPhone is about 6 or 7%. A hundred percent of the cost of an iPhone is treated as a Chinese export and a U.S. import, but their value added is only about seven percent, give or take, because they buy the you know the the Gorilla Glass they buy from uh, Germany, uh, the um, circuits they buy from Japan, uh, they buy other components from South Korea, so they have to pay as much as they get, and then they're just assemblers. These are Lego-style assembly jobs. And, you know, don't underestimate the extent of, you know, the poor working conditions, slave labor, prisoner labor, some of the things that go into this. But American companies are getting the wake-up call, they're getting the message, and what they're doing, this is a very big deal, they're moving the supply chain origin to Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, and these are 10-year decisions. You You don't move your factory from China to Vietnam and then move it back next year if things are good. You keep it there. They get, again, this, these are major fixed assets, major long-term investments. So if you move it out, you're not coming back, maybe uh, maybe ever. And so, so these are permanent losses of jobs to China. Um, and their, um, their GDP is uh, uh, overstated, grossly overstated. My adjustment gets them down from, you know, round numbers from about 6.2% to maybe you know, a little under four, three point eight or so. But I've seen other scholars whose opinion I respect say it's more like two and a half percent. Some say zero. Okay. So China is uh, the the growth slowdown is uh, abrupt. Uh, it's material and it's getting worse. And um, so what will happen is Xi's status is now at risk. I mean, okay, he may be president for life, and Xi thought and all that. He may be the most powerful leader since Mao, but um, you know the Cultural Revolution got a little bit out of control for Mao too, and so the Politburo they're going to be careful, but they may get rid of Xi at some point, or you may see social unrest. You may see Hong Kong writ large, and Hong Kong's not going away. That situation is not getting better. Ch- well, first of all, China will invade. They kind of already have. They haven't sent in the People's Liberation Army, but they haven't armed paramilitary police force. They're already in there and they'll do more, the violence will get worse, the social unrest will get worse. And I've been to, you know, I've been going to Hong Kong for uh, you know, 35 years or more. It, it's interesting, if you had asked me in the early 80s, and, and you know, when I first started going to Hong Kong, you know, just describe Hong Kong, I would, say, I would have said, well, it's the second most vibrant city in the world after New York. New York would always be number one, but you know, nightlife, energy, finance, attitude, everything about Hong Kong was just, you know, yeah. amazing. Every time I went back there, and I was there um, last year, it got worse. It got more subdued, people got more depressed. And then in the 2000s, I could really detect the funk. It's like, yeah, we're here, we're working, we're a financial center, but this is no fun. And, uh, you know, we're kind of looking over our, our, our backs. And the last time I was in Hong Kong, um, I was giving a speech, very high level, the Asia Society was hosting it. Um, and uh, somebody took me aside and said, uh, Jim, be careful what you say. And I had never heard that before, not in Hong Kong. I mean, you might have, someone might have said that in Beijing or Moscow or someplace, but not in Hong Kong. So and I, I said what I wanted anyway, I was getting out the next day, but um, it, it's bad. Well, it, it's obviously bad because there are violent demonstrations and uh, uh, people are, uh, a few people have died and more may die, but that's going to get worse. That genie's out of the bottle. Okay. But a global recession is highly unusual, and that appears to be what we're heading for. So my forecast, you know, I, I do update them, but the, but big picture, it goes as follows. So what is Jay Powell doing? First of all, March 1st, 2022, the Fed fund policy rate, interest rates were zero, and we're now at four and a half percent. Even in the Volcker days, we never went up four and a half percent in 10 months, not that fast. And so here we are. So what is Powell doing? Well, he's given five speeches on the subject. I don't know why Wall Street doesn't listen, but he keeps trying. He said the same thing every time. He said, inflation is job one. We're just going after inflation. You know, believe us. Um, there is going to be a recession. Unemployment is going to go up. 
there's going to be pain. I, you know, I've never heard a Fed chairman use the word pain. He used it five times in one paragraph in the Jackson Hole speech. Um, and that's what we're doing. And, and, and believe us when we say it. According to Jim Rickards, a global recession is coming and it's going to be painful. Unemployment will go up, the economy is slowing down, and the Federal Reserve has already used every single tool that they have. Inflation has come down but for a really bad reason. We will get into the reason later in the video. There's the myth of something called the terminal rate. Simply put, it's a rate that the Federal Reserve needs to reach so that inflation will come down on its own without further rate hikes. Wall Street said the Fed is already at the terminal rate so they don't need to raise it anymore, but the Fed is saying, no, we haven't reached the terminal rate yet so we have to keep raising it until we reach the 2% inflation target. So the question is, how long will the Fed keep raising the interest rates? We're already over 5% now and the Fed's still planning to raise it even more? With the current high interest rate, these tech companies already laying off a lot of their employees because they have to tighten their finances. What if the Fed raises it even more? Let's find out. Now, how long will he raise rates? How quickly? And, and what's he trying to do? Powell is trying to get to something that he calls the terminal rate. But the definition of the terminal rate is it's a rate that's high enough to cause inflation to come down on its own without further hikes. So uh, we'll get to a level and then inflation is coming down, by the way. And in, uh, in the last five months, it's gone from in the U.S., it's gone from about 9% to 8.7, 8.2, 7.4, 7.1. So it is coming down. Having said that, the target is 2% and 7.1 is still a far cry from two. So he's he's not there, but he's making progress. So here's the, I hate to use the word conundrum, but it kind of is. Wall Street's saying, you're done. You, you, you did it. Mission accomplished. Inflation is coming down. You got what you want to give it time. Stop raising rates. You're going to kill the economy. But the Fed is saying, well, we actually don't know. We can't untangle it. Yes, inflation is coming down. That's subjective. But is it coming down because we're still raising rates? Or is it coming down because we're at the terminal rate? Those are two different things. Right now, and this is what Powell's been saying, the Fed leans to the view that they're not at the terminal rate, that inflation is coming down because they're raising rates. They have not achieved the terminal rate. So Powell and the Fed have said, yeah, inflation's coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate, probably two more hikes, and then we'll pause. Um, and then and then if we're right, we'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all this stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff, I mean, the Fed's thinking mid-2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street are saying no. You're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think. Uh, and rates are going to have to come down sooner than uh, uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it. Uh, and you'll probably be the last to know. So with Wall Street, with the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message, why why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to uh, 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. Jim Rickard said something about the Volcker mistake and why Jerome Powell is still raising the interest rate and not cutting it yet. The famous Fed pivot, as Wall Street calls it. Jay Powell doesn't want to repeat the Volcker mistake by cutting the interest rates too early and failing to bring inflation down. Do you know why the interest rate was raised to 20% back in the 1980s? It's because of the Volcker mistake. The tale goes as follows, in the late 1970s, inflation was going up a lot and therefore the interest rates rose from around 4.5% to 10%. But that 5% raise took three years, from 1976 to 1979. Meanwhile, the current rate hike that we have now is the fastest in history, we went from 0 to 5 and a quarter percent in just one year. Back in the 80s, we had a recession, and the chairman of the Fed Paul Volcker had to cut the interest rate down by 7%. Not 0.7% but 7 full percentage points. He cut the interest rate from 17% to around 10%. And after that pivot, he raised it back to 20%, and three years later in 1987 the rates finally came back to normal. Back then, we needed 10 years in order to finally win the inflation fight. And now what? We're expecting it to win in a couple of months? The Fed just raised the rates fastest in history and people expect to bring it back down? Let's get into the detail. People forget that there was a recession in 1980. 
It was sharp, but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates. And the industry said, fine, we're just not going to lend anybody any money. The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the, with the uh, pandemic panic. Uh, and then they said, oh, sorry, just kidding. And then they took the ceiling off and then things got back to, to normal. Now, this was a time when farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington and they were circling the Fed building. And one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed and he and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That I mean, that all happened. So uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker, uh, not quite panicked, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not not 0.7, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which number one was unnecessary because the recession was caused by a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected. And number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse. And that's when Volcker had to raise rates to 20%. And Volcker, in hindsight, and he said this in his last book, just before he died, um, he said, we, we shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission. So now Powell, remember, Powell's not an economist. He's a lawyer. So he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that, you know, looking at both sides. Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, before the battle against inflation is won, because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger. And then you do have to destroy the economy, as we did in 1981-82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then. But at the time, that was horrific. But but Volcker and others have said that was a blunder he never should have done. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy. And that's what's driving him, even as Wall Street screams, you're already there. So so the question, so that's the lay of the land. There's the, there's the two competing sides. How does this play out? We learned a lot from Jim about the current situation and what Jerome Powell will be doing. But there's more to that story. Powell doesn't even understand what's going on in the real world which is inflation itself. There are two sources of inflation, the supply side and the demand side. We are at the supply side inflation which means the supply of goods is scarce but the demand is high and therefore the prices go up. But supply side inflation can transform into demand side inflation and this is where the dangers begin. People's spending behavior changes and they're worried that something worse will happen, and then they grab everything they can, and therefore the demand rises, and you got yourself inflation caused by an increase in the demand side. That's what most people don't understand, including Wall Street. Wall Street said inflation will come down on its own because we've reached the terminal rate. But Jerome Powell thinks we are not done yet and therefore he will raise rates even more. And what does Jim Rickards think? Does he think Powell is at the terminal rate yet? In my view, Powell probably is there. He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat. At least where I went to school, curve was curved. This, this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't. But the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, don't... Um, if you want to forecast Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed because you have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest. The unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. As I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. So they, they think they have to keep fighting this fight. But here's here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year. There are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it is it is coming down. But there are two sources of inflation. And it's going to sound obvious, but you got to separate them, the supply side and the demand side. They both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And, you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Uh, you know, bare shelves and you couldn't get 
uh, certain things. It, was, it wasn't that every supermarket shelf was bare the way it was in East Germany in the 1950s, but something was always missing, and that's still the case today. So, of course, prices went up, and uh, you know people were trying to pay whatever they had to to get what they needed, and energy prices were a big driver of that. So that feeds through as a form of inflation. The other kind of inflation is from the demand side. So the supply side is called um, a cost push. Costs go up, and they push it onto the consumers. The other kind is from the demand side. It's called demand pull. Uh, and basically, consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. Um, and so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side, but by the late 70s, 80s, and Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could, but it hasn't happened yet. Here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices because mm-hmm. people can't afford it. Like, you know, maybe if demand is inelastic, if you got to fill up your Ford F-150 truck with gasoline to take the kids to school or go to work. But if you're unemployed, you're not buying any gas because you're not leaving the house. So, so it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if, if, if I'm right, and I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. If I have to, if I used to pay $75 to fill up my tr- truck with gas, and now I have to pay $150, which is about right, I'll do it because I got to get to work. But that's $75 I, I'm not going to spend on something else. I'm not going to go out for dinner. I'm not going to go to a show, a concert, or you know, buy a... Um, you know, a, a new, uh, uh, you know, a new camera, whatever, whatever it might be. So it it does tend to depress um, demand, destroy demand, and hurt the economy. And then it slows down, and then the inflation comes down on its own. That appears to be happening, but Powell hasn't really made the distinction. He's still he's fighting the last war. I hate to use a cliche, but he's fighting the Volcker War. And what he's got looks a little bit more like the Herbert Hoover War. That looks a little bit more like the 1930s than the 1970s. So the bottom line on all this is the Fed is going to raise rates at least twice more for the reasons I mentioned. Powell doesn't want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He thinks the battle's not won. He has to get to the terminal rate. In reality, he's probably already there if there is such a thing as a terminal rate. It's another one of these things they made up. Um, uh, inflation is coming down on some will probably continue, but for really bad reasons. In 2020, they were back to where they started in 2013, except worse because the balance sheet was even bigger. It's not going to take seven years this time. It might be more like seven months. And the reason is twofold. Number one, we're more leveraged and the stock market is more bubbly. And so the whole thing's more vulnerable. Number two, the market has seen this movie before. Like, hey, we watched this play out. We know it it doesn't work. And the Fed blocks. Now, so if the Fed suddenly slams on the brakes, says we're not going to keep raising rates along the lines I projected earlier. Okay, that might give the stock market a boost. And you can't assume that won't happen you got to watch for that but i would expect that things would have to get pretty ugly in in all events before the fed got that message on the other hand if if powell gets confirmed and feels like it's his last term and here's his chance to be paul volcker and he's just going to keep raising rates he said my job is to get inflation under control the rest of you people you're responsible for fiscal policy and tax policy and spending and um you know shutting down the keystone pipeline welfare all that that's on you, not me. I my job is to get rid of inflation. If he does that, and he could, he might. You're looking at a recession. Kind of looks like the global financial crisis, and hope it doesn't. And there is a difference between extreme recession and financial crisis. They're two different things, but they can happen at the same time as as did happen in 2008. Would the Fed back off if it became apparent? that they were going to cause a stock market crash, a disorderly collapse, and a severe recession? The answer is almost certainly yes. But the problem is it might happen 
uh, right. a- anyway, and I was, they, they might have gone too far. And this almost happened in 2018. And that was my mm-hmm. point. It was that by the, by the time they realized their mistake, it might already be too late. So that's one danger, which you, if they, if they had perfect information, oh, gee, we went too far. Gee, we couldn't pull this off. We need to back off. They might back off exactly as you described, but they don't have perfect information. They have flawed models. They tend not to look at history and they could behind the curve. They could crash the car before they knew it was out of control. It's like slamming on the brakes on ice. You can slam on the brakes, but you're going to go for a long time before the car stops. So that's one problem. This, the second problem is you, you have to separate, as I said, recession, even severe recessions from financial crises. In 1998, we had a financial crisis, but no recession. Uh, in 1994, we had a financial crisis, no recession. In 2000 and 2020, we had a severe recession, no financial crisis. That was not a financial crisis. In 2000, 2001, we had a, the, the NASDAQ collapsed 80%, but there was only a very mild recession and that was not a financial crisis. So the Fed might say, and again, might, cause who knows, but they might say, well, of course we don't want a financial crisis. Now to your point, Nick, nobody wants that and they do get out of control. But we're not worried about that. You know, we learned our lesson in 2008. We had Dodd Frank, uh, and I had this discussion with uh, uh, James Gorman, the CEO of uh, Morgan Stanley. I briefed their board, and they they gave me a lot of pushback. They said, "Oh, you don't understand, Jim. We've we've uh, we've you know we have more capital and greater liquidity and less leverage and better credit." And I I granted. I said, you, "You're absolutely right. It's a nice job. You're a stronger bank now than you were then." But in a financial crisis, it doesn't matter. The, the, the problem is systemic. In other words, as an individual bank, you may be better off, but if the whole system's collapsing, you can't necessarily withstand that. So they they don't want that. But what if they said to themselves, you know what, we don't want a financial crisis, but we don't think that's going to happen. But we'll, but maybe we'll just have to bear a recession. Volcker knew what he was doing. Volcker knew that there was going to be a recession. And the recession of 1981-82 that he caused was at the time the worst since the Great Depression. Now, we've surpassed that twice since then, uh, 2008 and uh, 2020, although it's hard it's hard to know what 2020 was. I mean, down 36% in two months and up 38% in the next two months. I mean, what what is that? But, uh, but at least in technical terms, um, we've had two worse recessions, 20, 2008 and 2020 since then. But at the time, and I, I began to live through that, I was around, uh, that was the worst recession. But Volcker knew that would happen. He said, that's the price we have to pay to break the back of inflation. And he did. And by 1986, inflation was like 2% or 1.8%. Now, there was far less worry about financial crises at the time. Uh, because remember, this was before the repeal of Glass-Steagall. You know, commercial banks, no one really cared about investment banks. They could fail. So what? They cared about the commercial banks, and they had a pretty good handle on that. Um, so they weren't worried about financial crisis. But today, you would be, uh, be for the reasons we mentioned. So, the, so there are two possible major blunders here. But again, don't under, underestimate the Fed's ability to do both. One, <laughs> one is that they could, they could decide they don't want a recession, but not know until too, until it was too late. Mm-hmm. They just tighten into it, don't know until it's too late, and then the damage is done. The other one is they could sign up for a recession, say, yeah, sorry, but that's the price of getting inflation under control and trigger a financial crisis that nobody wants, but could happen anyway. So, you know, it's kind of so encrypted, uh, you know, take your pick. Severe recession, but we know it's coming. Recession that causes a financial crisis that we didn't want, or just let the inflation rip. What's the good outcome there? What, what's the good one? Yeah. But I think I think those are the three choices. I think you're right. I can tell you exactly what the Fed's going to do, and you can do this at home. So if listeners want to take notes, it's it's really easy. First of all, what is the problem the Fed's trying to solve? What is their solution? And then what are the exceptions to that so that we can have a complete predictive analytic model? The problem they're trying to solve is the following. We know from a long series of experiences, you know, 30 or more business cycles since the end of World War II, that when the U.S. is in a recession, you have to cut interest rates three to 4% to get the U.S. out of a recession. You need three to 400 basis points of cuts to get the U.S. It's like a plane 
you're heading for the ground, how do you pull it out of a nosedive and get it back up in the sky? The answer is 300 basis points of cuts. How do you cut interest rates 300 basis points when you're only at 75 basis points? The answer is you can't. And forget about negative rates. The evidence is now pretty good that negative rates do not work. In other words, negative rates are not more of the same. When you go from, let's say, a half of 1%, then you go to a quarter, and then you go to zero, and then you keep going to negative 25, you didn't just ease by another 25 basis points. The evidence from Japan and Europe is that you're through the looking glass and you have very strange effects, really unintended consequences. And I'll give you a couple examples. So the conventional theory is, well, the more I cut interest rates, the more stimulus I get. That's a joke, but that's what they think. But if I go negative, you're absolutely going to go out and spend the money. Because if you don't spend the money, I'm going to take it away. You sit there long enough, you'll have nothing left in your bank account because I'm going to take with these negative interest rates, I'm going to take it away. So people will run out and spend. And the other thing is that, you know, it's, it's obviously, you know, from the lending point of view, they'll borrow money, you know, because the bank pays you to be a borrower. But here's what happens in the real world. And this is the difference between academics and human beings. When people see negative interest rates, people have goals in mind. They have lifetime goals, right? They want a kid's education, parents' health care, their own health care, retirement. If you start taking their money away with negative rates, guess what they do? They save more. Like, hey, I got to put my kids through college. You're taking my money. Well, I better save more. And then what kind of signal is the central bank sending with negative interest rates? They're sending a deflationary signal. So people go, well, if, you're, if you think it's going to be deflation, I'm not going to spend money. I'll wait till the price comes down. So you're trying to encourage lending and spending. And what you get is more savings and no spending, deferred spending. You get the exact opposite of what you want. So again, another uh, egghead experiment gone awry. But the point being, so negative rates don't work. So zero bound really is zero. It really is a boundary. And, you know, Bernanke has said this in his recent writings, and, and I think he's right about that. So back to the problem. How do you cut interest rates 300 basis points when you're at 75? Well, the answer is you can't. So you have to raise them to 300 basis points. So the problem the Fed is trying to solve is how do they get rates to three and a quarter percent before the next recession? Now, I'm not saying the Fed sees a recession, and that's easy because the Fed never sees a recession. In 102 years, the Fed has never seen a recession, never forecast a recession, but they know their economic history. We are eight years into an expansion. This ex it, it feels punk. I mean, the growth is anemic, but you know, labor force participation is low, productivity is dropping. There are a lot of bad things going on, but in fact, we are in the eighth year, actually coming up on, soon be entering the ninth year of an expansion, which began in June 2009. Right. By the way, you have a hard time convincing most Americans that we're not still in a recession. Depressions are different than recessions. You know, the technical definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP with rising unemployment, a couple other bells and whistles, little subjective factors, but that's basically it. So people, when you say depression, they're like, huh, depression sounds worse than a recession. And if recession is two quarters of declining GDP, then a depression must be like 10 quarters of declining GDP because it's got to be worse. But that's not the definition. The definition of a depression, you can have growth in a depression, but it's below trend growth. In other words, if trend is three, three and a half, and you're actually banging out one and a half, two, that gap between, let's say, one and a half and three and a half percent growth, that's depressed growth. It's an output gap. It compounds over time and you never get it back. We are losing trillions of dollars of wealth. We are impoverishing future generations on a relative basis because of our inability to get back to trend growth. So the reason American people feel this and don't listen to the economists and the right is because we're in a depression. So leaving that aside, the Fed at least understands the business cycle and the fact that the next recession, you know, they say they don't die of old age, but they do die and we're getting closer to the next one. So they are in a desperate race to get rates up to three and a half percent before the next recession hits so they can cut them to get out of the recession. The question is, can you raise rates enough to cure the next recession without causing the recession you're preparing to cure? That's the dilemma. That's the finesse. My answer is no, they're not going to be able to do it, but they think they can. Why are they in this box? Well, because Bernanke should have raised rates in 2010, 2011, in the early stages of the expansion, when the economy would have been much better able to bear it than it is now. Bernanke skipped a whole cycle. He skipped a whole rate increase cycle to pursue these wacky experiments and, you know, QE and zero interest rate policy and all that. I spoke to Bernanke about this and he used the word experiment. He said this was an experiment. He, you know, it, Bernanke made his academic reputation by studying the Great Depression, you know, in the wake of Friedman and Anna Schwartz and some others. But he, he was a great scholar of the Great Depression. 
And he got his chance to kind of try out his theories. But what he told me was, he said, 30 years from now, some new Ben Bernanke, some young scholar will look back and tell us if we did a good job or not. We actually don't know right now. See, the, the Great Depression was, was really two technical recessions, 29 to 33 and then 1937, 38. But from 33 to 37, we had an expansion. But the whole thing was a depression because we never got out of it. You know, the stock market recovered the 1929 high in 1954. It was a long time to get back to even. But Bernanke's mantra was doing something is better than doing nothing. I completely disagree. It's better to do nothing if you don't know what you're doing. And this is really the monetary equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath. You know, doctors say, you know, first rule of being a doctor is first do no harm. Anyway, bottom line is by pursuing QE and zero interest rate policy, Bernanke failed to raise rates during the early stages of a cyclical expansion, which he should have done. If he had, if he had, the economy would have been just fine and we'd be able to cut them today. But he didn't. So Janet Yellen now has to make up for lost time. So that's the mission. But again, and this is what the market completely does not get. And the Wall Street economists don't get. Nobody gets this because they see the Fed raising rates and they've done the correlations and the regressions back to World War II. And they go, huh. Every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. So if the Fed's raising rates, the economy must be getting stronger. So bid up stock prices, et cetera. But that's like saying umbrellas cause rain. That was they've got the causality backwards. The Fed never leaves the economy, ever. The Fed follows the economy. So a normal business cycle looks like this. So you get a little expansion going and unemployment starts to go down and industrial capacity utilization starts to go up and inflation starts to go up. And the Fed's watching, 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 and then it keeps going. They go, oh, it's getting a little hot. We better raise rates. And they raise rates. But of course, they started too late. The expansion keeps going. Inflation keeps going up. Unemployment keeps going down. Then the economy starts to cool down. Unemployment goes up and then prices go down and capacity utilization drops. And we get into a recession like, huh, we better cut. You know, and then they cut and cut and cut and cut. And then you hit the bottom and then you come out of it again. So think of that as like a nice, pretty sine wave, right? That's a business expansion, business contraction over and over. 30 or so times since the end of World War II, with the Fed always following the economy, never leaving the economy. So all the big brands on Wall Street, they've got all this data and they say, well, every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. That has absolutely been true for like 30 times since the end of World War II. It is not true today. The reason it's not true today is because Bernanke skipped the cycle and they're playing catch up. For the first time since 1937, the Fed is tightening into weakness as a key thing to bear in mind. The Fed is tightening into weakness. They are not leading the economy to strength. They are not responding to strength, even though Wall Street thinks they are. And there's a great danger that they're actually going to cause the recession they're preparing to cure, as I mentioned. The Fed will raise rates 25 basis points four times a year from now until the middle of 2019 until they get them to three and a quarter percent. So like clockwork, every March, June, September, December, for 2017, 2018, into 2019, look for a Fed rate hike until they get to three and a quarter percent, at which point they'll be able to say, all right, now we're three and a quarter. If we have a recession tomorrow, we can cut them back down to zero again and get out of it. That'll be mission accomplished. Now, this is why I was sitting there in December, like, yep, they're going to raise them in March. And right now I'll tell your listeners they're going to raise them in June. There's your Fed response function. There's your baseline scenario. What are the exceptions to Fed rate hike. And under what conditions will they not raise rates? Because this, everything I just described to you, they've had in mind since March 2015 when Yellen took patience out of the statement. That was the end of forward guidance. And by the way, if you go back to 2015, you know, I said they're not going to raise rates all year and they weren't going to do the lift off that, that people were looking for in March, June, September. And they didn't lift off in September because the Chinese rate exchange devaluation, the stock market fell out of bed August 2015. Finally, they raised them in December 2015 and Wall Street was ready for March. I said, no, in June, no, September, no. It wasn't until December 2016 that they raised them the second time. So obviously, there are conditions under which they don't raise rates, notwithstanding the baseline scenario. So what are those conditions? There are three. Well, four, actually. So if you see job creation below 75,000, that will cause them to pause. By the way, pause is the key word. If you go home through the speeches, you'll see the word pause. In Dudley's recent remarks, pause is the 
Fed's jargon for we're not going to raise rates. We got the gym scenario, which I took from the Fed as their scenario, or a technical recession. So, you know, we're going to know Friday what the first quarter GDP is. It's pretty close to negative, but I'm not saying we're in a recession now. We might be. But if you see a recession, they'll pause. See job creation below 75,000, they'll pause. By the way, that's a very low bar. You know, if you see a jobs report, see, this is the other thing that confuses Wall Street. You see a jobs report with 100,000 jobs. So Wall Street goes, oh, that report's really weak. The Fed's going to think twice. No, 75,000 is the number. Yellen told us that. It was in one of her speeches. You just have to be a geek like me and, and read all the speeches. So the third factor would be disinflation. So the Fed has this 2% inflation target. They missed it for six years. They're finally getting close to hitting it. By the way, I think the listeners know they use the uh, PCE core deflator year over year. There's PPI and CPI and core, not a bunch of inflation indices, but we know what they use. PCE core deflator year over year. That actually has been getting close to 2%. But if you see it turn around, if you see that gap down to like 1.5, 1.4, 1.3, 1.3, then they will pause. The last condition for the pause is a disorderly decline in stock markets, more than 5%. If you see a 6 7 8% decline, so if the S&P went down 100 points, Fed doesn't care. Dow Jones goes down 1,000 points, Fed doesn't care. But beyond that, if you see the S&P start to go down 150 or the Dow start to go down 1,500 points in a disorderly way, it looks a little scary. It looks like there's no bottom. It looks like... If you see that, they'll pause. So the Fed is going to raise like clockwork four times a year for the next two and a half years, unless you see job creation below 75,000, disinflation, a technical recession. If you don't see one of those things, they're going to raise rates. And so right now, I don't see any of them. I mean, they could all happen, but it looks like, you know, growth is going to be positive. Job creation has been decent, you know, over 100,000. Disinflation is probably coming, but not quite here yet. And they'll want to see a couple months in a row. And the stock market's not crashing. So none of the pause conditions are in place. Therefore, they will raise rates. Simple. China doesn't have any of that. None of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure. And most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't trust the Chinese as far as you can throw them. I was a facilitator and then a participant in the first ever financial war game ever conducted by the Pentagon. We did this at a a top secret uh, location called the Warfare Analysis Laboratory. One of the things we did there, I was on the China team. I wanted to make it realistic. So I said, let's lie, cheat and steal because that's what Wall Street does. And that's that's a more realistic game. So I recruited a friend of mine who's fluent in Russian to be on the Russian team. And I had dinner with him before we went down to uh, to the laboratory. And I said, look, here's the plan. I'm, I'm going to persuade my China team colleagues to um, basically announce a, a new gold standard. And uh, we, we've accumulated enough gold and we're going to say for now and our currency is backed by gold. We're going to put the gold in Switzerland to keep everybody happy. We're going to issue notes from a, a bank created in London under, under English laws to keep everybody happy. Here's the thing. We're going to say from now on, if you want our exports, you have to pay for us in this new currency. We're not taking dollars anymore. And furthermore, and if you want some of this new currency, you can do you can deposit your gold in Switzerland and the bank will issue you some currency so you're in the system. Or you can trade with us and run a surplus and then we'll pay you in the currency and you can use that to buy our stuff or we'll give you loans. But one way or another, we're done with the dollar. And obviously this is very forward leaning, but the whole idea of a war game is to help the Pentagon think five or 10 years ahead. So the first thing that happened when these, you go to your embassy, your conclave, you, you come out and you stand up at the podium, you announce your plans, and then everybody reacts and it's discussed, et cetera. The first thing that happened is there was a group. So we had the you had the red team, the yellow team, the blue team, as the case may be, and they're all different countries or areas. But there's a white team, which are the referees. They decide what you did. And the first thing they did when we announced the goal move, they ruled it as an illegal move. They said, no. No, that's not in any of our scenarios. You can't do that. And I stood up, about 100 people in the room, you know, three-star generals, CIA, FBI. You know, I said, wait a minute. I said, this is a war. There are no illegal moves in a war. The whole idea is to be out of the box. We live in a world where there are no boxes. That's what we're doing here. So they agreed. They said, okay, we, we think it's a really dumb idea, but we'll let you do it. Well, 
Over the course of two days, it accelerated and gathered momentum. At the end of it, Russia got PowerPoints. Okay, so this was 2009. Within 10 years, so, so what, were the, what facts happened? Within 10 years, Russia tripled its gold reserves. Uh, last week, the dollar value of Russia's gold exceeded the dollar value of its treasury securities. They have 20% of their reserves in gold and their, the value of their gold is more than the value of the US treasury securities. They're dumping treasuries buying gold. Exactly what we warned the Pentagon about 10 years ago. Um, and here it is in China has more than tripled its reserves. So we're not there yet, but we're moving to some kind of gold back world. But the point is that was all in the war game. That's all in the book. And I made one other point. I said, Currency wars don't happen all the time. They might only happen twice in a century. But when they happen, they can last for 10 or 15 years. That's how long it takes to sort out. What you describe about the Chinese money supply is absolutely correct. People in the United States complain, oh, the Federal Reserve has printed $4 trillion in the past year. And they have. They have printed $4 trillion in the last year. They're taking the Fed balance sheet from about... 3.5 trillion to 7.5 trillion. So yeah, we printed four trillion dollars in the past year. Didn't do any good, won't do any good, but we did it. Uh, but Chinese money supply is even larger and growing faster. Now, I don't want to get into the weeds on China's internal monetary policy. I could, except to say that they're grossly over leveraged. The economy is investment driven, not consumption driven. They're about 40%, 45% investment. The US is about 25% investment. So that gives you some idea of how much, how investment is to the Chinese, which is actually okay if you're investing in productive assets that pay the way. They're not. They're wasting the money. I've, I've been to China many times, been going back and forth there for uh, 35 years. Um, I've been out in the countryside. I don't just stick to the hotel lobby in Beijing. I got mud on my boots visiting these ghost cities. And um, so each ghost city, there are a bunch of them, actually seven up. Seven, imagine building seven cities. That's what I saw. And so they got one or two skyscrapers and they got mixed use and they got retail shopping, a country club, a hotel, a golf course, a pond, highway stops, airport, etc. And it's all empty. I mean, this is all empty. Shiny new construction, some of it still under construction, um, all empty. So I said to the communists, I said, what are you guys doing here? I mean, no, nobody's here. So, oh, don't worry, don't worry. People will be coming from the countryside. They will be populating these cities. And uh, I said, when? I said, no one's coming. And uh, besides that, you've already drained the countryside. That already happened. But I said, you cannot mothball a building. It's not like some old clothes. I mean, you the way a building maintains itself, it gets occupied and is maintenance and people fix it and all that. I, I, I visited, I used to travel a lot in Central Africa in the early 80s, um, Zaire at the time, today it's the Congo, I was in Kinshasa, but it was right after the 70s commodities boom. And they took the money, and of course they wasted it, and they built these skyscrapers in Kinshasa, which is like a swampy, scary, funky, you know, city. But there's a skyscraper, but the windows are falling out and there were rust stains running down this, the side and the elevators were broken. So it might have looked nice the day they built it, but it was never really used. And now it was literally when I was there, it wasn't that much later after they built it, it was falling apart. So that's going to happen in China. My point being, if you uh, apply, you know, generally accepted accounting principles to their investment account, you would write it off the day they open the building because nobody's there. It's not worth anything. So they're wasting the money. They're over leveraged. They're over printed. However, none of that has anything to do with the status of the Chinese yuan as a global reserve currency. The, the yuan is not a reserve currency. It will not be probably in my lifetime, maybe never. And I'll tell you why, because uh, a lot of people don't understand what a reserve currency really is. You know, you get a report from the IMF and it says, you know, 60% of global reserves are in dollars, which is true, and about 25% are in euros, which is true. So 85% of global reserves are in dollars or euro, which means the only meaningful exchange rate in the world is the euro US dollar cross rate. Everything else is working around the edges. You got some sterling and yen and Swiss francs and a couple other things. Aussie dollar is tiny, believe it or not, good currency, but not a, not a big part of it. And China's like this kind of invisible 1% sliced down at the bottom. And China has $1.4 trillion in its reserves. But here's the point. It's not as if they have pallets of $100 bills stacked up in the basement of the People's Bank of China. They don't. You invest in securities. In other words, they're dollar-denominated securities. So it's not actually dollars. 
the treasury bills notes and bonds denominated in dollars. So the thing that makes a reserve currency is not the currency, it's the bond market. You need something to invest in. Uh, again, so you need a, a liquid bond market with different maturities, different interest rates. You need dealers, you need auctions, you need payment and clearance systems, you need repo or repurchase agreements, futures, options, when issued trading, uh, you know, custodians, the rule of law. There's a whole mess of infrastructure, which we started working on uh, when Alexander Hamilton was, uh, you know, advising George Washington. And we've been doing it ever since. And others, Bank of England has done the same. China doesn't have any of that. None of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure. And most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't ch trust the Chinese as far as you can as throw them. Um, and so they have no chance of being a global reserve currency, none. Same with the Russian ruble, same with a lot of other currencies, same with Bitcoin. There's no, show me the Bitcoin bond market. Maybe you can get my attention, but not sooner. So none of those are going to replace the dollar. I, first thing, I, I, my wife hates me to admit this, but I was once a registered lobbyist in Washington. I ran an office there. I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. And the first thing I learned in Washington is you can't beat something with nothing. You know, if you hate a policy or a program, you just hate it. You write op-eds. You put fine. You're not going to change it unless you bring something to replace it. So for all the criticisms of the dollar, and there are plenty of them, you're not going to dethrone the dollar as the leading global reserve currency unless you can show me what you're going to replace it with. And there's one and only one contender in the world today, which is gold. So that's a whole other conversation. I'm not saying we're going to be on a gold standard tomorrow. Uh, as far as China's concerned, yeah, China's a house of cards. It's going to collapse. It's going to be ugly. Hard to say when, but probably sooner than later. And they, and they know it. And they're not going to be a global reserve currency. So we can put China to one side, but yeah, China's a house of cards. Now, getting it back to the United States, the first point, let's talk about stimulus first. So yeah, the Fed printed three, sorry, the Fed printed $4 trillion. Congress, we had trillion dollar, what are called baseline budget deficits going into the pandemic. So with no pandemic, we were going to have a trillion dollar deficit in 2020 and 2021. Now, Congress put $3 trillion on top of that with rescue and bailout programs last uh, March, April, and May. That was the CARES program, payroll protection plan, um, aid to hospitals, uh, uh, extended unemployment benefits, higher unemployment benefits, et cetera. And I'm not saying any of those things were bad. It was needed uh, to keep things from getting a lot worse. But we put $3 trillion on top of this. So there's $4 trillion for fiscal 2020. They just did a trillion last week uh, in the kind of final days of the Trump administration. So that's five trillion. And Biden has announced his plan. He's going to have a two trillion dollar rescue bailout so-called stimulus plan now. So that's seven trillion dollars plus the trillion dollar baseline for fiscal 2021. So there's eight trillion dollars in deficit spending in two fiscal years, four trillion dollars of money printing by the Fed. Now, those are the numbers. That's not. That's not projections. That that's baked in the pie. Just don't call it stimulus. It will have no stimulative effect. Does it again? As I say, keep the lights on. Yes. Did would it, would just some people keep their jobs last spring because their employer got payroll protection plans? Yes. Did other people benefit from increased unemployment benefits? Yes. Was a lot of that necessary because things were in such bad shape? Yes. So I'm not arguing that side of it, but it does not stimulate. It's not going to get us out of the depression. Let me be very specific as to why, because I don't like to, I don't make claims without backing it up. On the money supply, you can print all the money you want. But Milton Friedman was wrong, the monetarists are wrong, the Austrian school is wrong. Money printing does not cause inflation. What causes inflation is something called velocity, which is the turnover of money. The money has to be lent and spent. Banks have to be lenders. People and businesses have to be borrowers. You have to be spending it, get it in circulation, in other words, in order potentially to have some inflation. Uh, and that's the technical name for that is velocity. Velocity is dropping, sinking like a stone. And by the way, it's been dropping since 1998. It dropped faster in the 2008 crisis. It's dropping faster today. But the trend has been very steeply down for the last 22 years. Um, and so the you know, nominal GDP, so the, the, the dollar value of all goods and services, leaving aside inflation, that's, that's what we mean by nominal value. Nominal value of gross domestic product is money supply times velocity. How much money is there and how much does it turn over? Multiply one by the other and that's your nominal GDP. And I remind people that $7 trillion times zero is zero. 
meaning you can print the seven trillion dollars but if you don't have any velocity you don't have an economy and so you can understand monetary policy is a desperate race between increasing money supply and declining velocity one offsets the other so that you barely keep nominal GDP where it is. In fact, it's going to go down about six or seven percent. We're not getting back to 2019 levels of output. If you take 2019 as your baseline, we're not getting back to 2019 levels till 2023 at the earliest. We're not getting back to 2019 levels of job creation, the number of people who have jobs until 2025 at the earliest. That's why I call it a depression, not a recession. Now flip over to fiscal policy. It's like, hey, they're sending everybody $2,000 checks. And they are. The people are going to get those checks. And so the, the Wall Street, which you know usually gets things wrong. That's the first thing you got to know about Wall Street, because they don't really care about you. They care about rap fees and how they make money. So they're saying, all right, they're going to send out the $2,000 checks and people are going to get those checks and they're going to run right out. And they're going to buy a car, a refrigerator, you know, paint the kitchen, whatever it may be. No, the first two things are true. They're going to spend the money and they're going to, sorry, they're going to borrow the money and they're going to send people the checks. But when people get the checks, they're not spending it. What they're doing, they're saving it. They're, they're either paying down debt, which is equivalent to savings, or they're putting the money in the bank, which is savings. So certainly if you lost your job, you're not going to take your friends out to dinner. You're going to throw the money in the bank or pay the rent. Uh, but even if you didn't lose your job, you look around like maybe your spouse lost his job. Maybe um, your neighbor lost his job. Maybe you think you're next, like you have a job, but you're worried you're going to get fired next week. So you save it. And, and the, the name for that, economists call that precautionary savings or, you know, plain English, it's, it's saving for a rainy day, except it's raining everywhere. So, so they are going to, they are going to, send the checks out, but people aren't going to spend it. And that's the reason you're not going to get the stimulative effect, but you are going to increase the deficit, which gets back to this debt to GDP ratio. So take the total debt divided by GDP. And that's, that's some ratio. The research is very convincing, very clear. A number of studies show this, that up to about 90%, so 90% debt to GDP, you get a little bit of something called a, a, Keynesian, a Keynesian multiplier, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you get a dollar ten of GDP, or you get a dollar five of GDP. And it works maybe temporarily, but it works when people won't spend the money the government can. That's the idea. But when the debt to GDP GDP ratio goes above 90%. That's what physicists call a critical threshold or a phase transition. Now you're through the looking glass. Now the Keynesian multiplier drops below one, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, but you only get 90 cents of GDP. But meanwhile, the debt went up a dollar. So what's happening to the debt to GDP ratio? This is going up dollar for dollar, but this is going up 90 cents on the dollar. So the ratio is getting worse. Guess what the US GDP, debt to GDP ratio is today? The answer is it's about 135%. So we're way past that 90% threshold. And by the way, who's in that club? I can tell you, Lebanon, Greece, and Italy. So there's your lunch table for four, you know, the four super debtors league. And it just gets worse. And that G, that ratio past 90% is a headwind to growth because people look at it and like, hey, I don't have a PhD in economics, but I just don't like what I see. And people understand correctly, and this is the behavioral adaptation that policymakers on Wall Street do not understand. But the, the, the behavioral ad, adaptations people look at and say, you know, I don't know how this is going to end, but it's going to end. I'm either going to, we're either going to have a default or we're going to have something like hyperinflation to make the debt go away or they're going to raise my taxes. Not sure which, maybe all of the above, but I, I have to save more money to meet my lifetime goals in the face of some bad outcome that's going to come out of this. That's the real world behavior. And economists know very little about the real world. So, um, so the point is, Increasing the money supply doesn't work because velocity is declining. Increasing deficits doesn't work because people are saving, not spending, and they're preparing for worse outcomes. So neither one of these, you can call it money printing or spending, but don't call it stimulus because it doesn't stimulate. We're not getting out of this. And that's why I call my book, The New Great Depression. The people ask me, are we going to have a recession? And my answer is we might be in a recession right now and not even know it. Uh, we could be facing a global recession, including China, but just focusing on the U.S. because uh, that's the Fed's sort of territory. So Powell saying, you know, the economy is great is, is nonsense. What he said, he said, you know, by the end of the year, we could be looking at 4.2% unemployment, 35 to 4% interest rates, and, you know, kind of 2.7% inflation. And you're like, wait a second, inflation is 86 today. How do you get to 
you know, 2.7, number one, and then what about rising unemployment and, um, uh, and, and and higher interest rates? How do you reconcile those things? He said all three of those things, but what state of the world could make those things come true? There's only one, which is a recession. A recession would do it. A recession will raise unemployment, higher interest rates will cause the recession, and the recession will cause inflation to go down. So in effect, Powell was saying we're going to have a recession. Inflation, yeah, prices go up, so we understand that, or maybe put differently, the value of your money goes down. You don't get as much for your money, same thing. But inflation, broadly speaking, has two causes. One is called, not to get too technical, but it's called cost push. This comes from the supply side. So there's a shortage of oil. If there, and we've got a financial and economic war going on between Russia uh, and the United States. The U.S. really started it, but U.S., EU, Canada, Australia, Japan versus Russia. Um, that's obviously disrupting supply chain, cutting down energy supply, causing the price of oil to go up, et cetera. So that's coming from the supply side. And you're exactly right. The Fed can't drill for oil. The Fed can't plant wheat. The Fed can't make semiconductors. So they can't do anything about this. And the supply chains are breaking down. They were breaking down before the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine has made it worse. The other source of inflation is called um, demand pull. And this is when individuals, you, me, and all of our viewers and, you know, everyday Canadians and Americans worry about inflation. We say, well, you know, I'm thinking about buying a refrigerator. Better buy it now before the price goes up with a car, house, or whatever it, it might be. They're different, but they affect each other. When, when, the, when the cost push inflation from the supply side has enough effect, there's a tipping point or critical threshold in, in psychology. We say, you know, maybe it is out of control. I better go buy some stuff. Then the velocity of money goes up and then you get inflation. So the Fed can't do anything about cost push. They can't do anything about the price of oil. And you're right about that. But they're looking at the demand side, you know, saying, hey, if this supply thing goes on long enough, eventually the psychology will change and we'll get demand pull uh, and behavioral, and that is really hard to, to change. So what they're trying to do, they know they can't change the supply side, but they're trying to squash the demand side before it gets out of control. Now, the question, of course, is can they do it? The answer is they can do it, but at what cost? So a general rule of thumb, this is really simple. You have to get, uh, forget about nominal interest rates. Nominal interest rates are the rates you see on your screen, you hear about the headlines and all that. Real interest rates are nominal interest rates minus inflation. Take the inflation out and see what's left. Well, right now, real interest rates are about 2%, actually one, one and three quarters under the Fed's policy rate. Inflation is 8.6%. So, you know, just round numbers, one and a half minus uh, eight and a half, uh, that's, uh, that makes the inflation rate negative seven. That's nowhere near. It's got to be positive two. Real rates have to be plus two to, to squash inflation. Right now, they're negative seven. So that implies that the Fed has to raise interest rates to 10.5% to get to positive two real interest rates. That's never going to happen. They're never going to get there. They will destroy the economy long before they get there. So the Fed has no hope of squashing inflation from the demand side, as you described, by raising rates, unless inflation comes down for other reasons. So what they're going to do, they're going to keep raising rates, you know, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, hope that inflation comes down from eight to maybe three, although I think that's a stretch. You could get into positive real rate territory, but they're really far away from it. So I think, by the way, it, I, I described what they're trying to do. I should make it clear they're going to fail. They, they, the, only way, the only way inflation comes down the way we're talking about is if they trash the economy. A severe recession. If that happens, yeah, you say, well, do you, people still need to put gas in their cars. Well, you're right, but not if they're unemployed because they're not going to work. There's a lot here that's just for show. It sounds good on TV, but um, the, there's a lot less here than we see. But the point is, this is not over anytime soon. And even if it were, when you break supply chains, you can't just put them back together. It's like breaking a vase in a thousand pieces, and you got to go buy a new vase. It's going to take years to undo this damage. So I spoke to the individual who was probably the single individual most responsible for building the modern supply chain. It was 30 years from 1989 to 2019. Uh, it was head of one of the largest companies in the world. And this is what they did, among other things. Uh, and he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. It took us three years to blow it up. It's not going to come back in a year. This is going to take 5, 10, 15 years to build a new one. So, so what, it's what I call supply chain 
Well, buying a refrigerator is a good idea. Buying a freezer might be a better idea. We're looking for food shortages by the fall. Now, when I say food shortages, in Africa and Middle East, this will mean mass starvation. You may see the greatest humanitarian crisis in history because they literally can't get the food. Everyone's like, well, gee, you can't get Ukrainian weight, uh, wheat. What's the big deal? Buy it from somewhere else. There is no, there is nowhere else. Canada and the United States grow an enormous amount of wheat, but we use most of it internally. And uh, we feed, because it's not for humans, by the way, we feed our animals. So this is how you feed cows, pigs. This is how you get beef and pork. This is an example of the supply chain, how it filters all the way through. So you would expect higher prices to persist. You would expect food shortages. Uh, buying a freezer is not a bad idea. Um, and uh, the future supply chain is going to be, the, it goes by different names. Uh, Janet Yellen calls it friendshoring. Uh, Macron calls it uh, constellation. Uh, I call it the College of Nations. But basically, we'll have supply chains in trade, but it'll be sort of members only. So U.S., Canada, Australia, Europe, others, Japan, uh, will be invited to join, but not China, you know, Russia is going to be in the waiting room for a while. We, sh we should be better allies of Russia, but the, the, the Democrats in the United States have pretty much made that possible, at least for the short run. Uh, and then there'll be other countries that are kind of neutral in, in that scheme, you know, Brazil, India, and others. But the point is you'll still have trade and you'll have supply chains, but it'll be kind of friendly countries, members only, uh, and exclude China. So that decoupling is going to go ahead. The Chinese seem to be not only fine with it, but they're actually leading the way. Uh, you know, semiconductor manufacturing is moving back to the United States. Um, you know, the 20 billion of uh, new semiconductor plants from Intel. And why is Taiwan Semiconductor spending over $5 billion to build new semiconductor fabrication plants in the United States? Well, obviously, because they're worried about China. We're reshuffling the deck, but it, none of this stuff is easy. I mean, uh, Semiconductor plants take five years to build a new refinery. Forget it. That's like seven to 10 years. We haven't had one in the United States since 1977. So it's going to take a while to do all this. Well, we can do it. So if I said we're definitely going to have inflation, you would know what to do. You'd buy gold, hard assets, land, silver, treasury notes, government bonds, et cetera. If I said we're definitely going to have deflation, you would also know what to do. You would uh, reduce leverage. You would uh, have more cash. Uh, and there are, other, there are other assets you could go into. The problem is we could have both. We, there's no question we have inflation right now. It's, it's, it's front and center. But if the Fed squashes it and causes a recession or worse, you could flip to deflation very quickly. So this is going to sound like a, 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 an obvious statement. What you want is diversification. Sounds obvious, but most people don't know what diversification is. I see people, I've got 50 stocks in 10 different sectors. I'm highly diversified. I'm like, no, you're not. You have one asset class called stocks. Real diversification, have a slice of stocks, gold, real estate, cash, um, agriculture is a good investment, energy, forget you know, the green new scam, that's a joke, uh, oil and natural gas are going to be around for a long time.